experience. Obviously, so many people who are <coughs> coming out on a really cold day and say and deciding that this is something that they want to find out a little bit more about. Um, I have a few things kind of to talk to you about today. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I'll be talking to you a little bit about is Euro, what it is, what it does. Um, and I'm also going to talk to you about brands and reputation and being proactive in your own reputation management. Um, I'm going to start by talking about something significantly less interesting and that's just a little bit about myself. So, um, as Nori mentioned, I'm from Kiltramont, which is just outside Kiltramont, and my background is in media and journalism. I uh, studied a four-year Bachelor of Arts in Journalism at DCU, and then when I was there, I worked very locally here in the Connacht Telegraph, and also with TV3, and um, briefly with the political unit in CBS News in Washington, DC. So, um, all equal in reputational terms, I'm sure, um, on the media front. So, when I finished college, um, I worked very briefly in marketing and I moved to digital communications. So that was writing an ad copy for Yahoo in the very early days of SEO. Um, so I started freelancing around then for national and um, national print for working as a journalist and an editor in a um, publishing company in Dublin. In the midst of the Celtic Tiger, then, like lots of other people, I decided that I would move and I decided to move west and I um, took on the role of senior journalist in the Clare Champion, Gemma Ennis, where I still live. So um, one of the things that I really loved about journalism is telling human stories and telling them in a way that connects with the reader or the audience. Um, and that's something that I, I think I've brought with me to the field of PR and public relations. So, in mid-2016, I was offered the role of communications officer with the University of Limerick. Um, and that's a role that I really, really enjoyed, and it's one that I got a um, great experience in, and I was really, really privileged to lead a number of global communications campaigns as part of that. So one of the highlights was um, I worked with a, a professor in <coughs> UL Graduate Entry Medical School called Professor Calvin Coffey, and he was advocating to have a part of the GUSH redesignated as a, um, an organ. And so I worked with him a little bit on a communications campaign around that and we ended up getting enormous traction online and um, maybe 2,000 stories around the world in the first week. Um, and then a lot of look back pieces and then he got a lot of opportunities from that. And also one of the things about it is that it wasn't um, overselling you know what he had it wasn't overselling the research it was telling it in a very authentic way which is really really important to an academic reputation is to to really be true to the research and to be true to um, the story and one of the, the things that emerged from that was he eventually ended up in the guinness book of world records and beyond that i also had the pleasure of project managing the public relations and communication side of the honorary doctorate for health activist um, Vicky Phelan, and that was in the university last year. And then in October, I joined Lira, which is the Irish Software Research Centre. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lira because um, I'm not sure how well known the brand is. So it's a world leading Science Foundation Ireland research centre, and it incorporates researchers from across Ireland's seven universities and also two of its ITs. So it's hosted at the University of Limerick and it combines the best software talent by bringing together researchers from um, DCU, from Dundalk, from Institute of Technology, uh, Dundalk Institute of Technology and IT Trilly, and also in UI Galway, Maynooth University, Trinity, College Dublin, and UCD and UCC. So it's funded by Science Foundation Ireland as well as through partnerships. And as you can possibly see from some of this, it gives you an idea of um, the impact of um, the research of Euro, both in terms of the economy, in terms of the payback for the investment inwards, and also in terms of the academic content that it produces. So, um, to give you a little bit more detail without getting maybe too caught up in it, the main areas um, that Lero works in is methods, for methods and standards for high integrity systems, 
autonomous and adaptive systems, software performance, security and privacy. Um, but these are all integrated into say, software for innovation and business um, processes, software for manufacturing competitive, competitiveness, so let's say agile, lean, that kind of thing. Also software for medical devices and healthcare and for smart cities and buildings, software for analytics and security, for cloud computing and financial services. So it's really, really diverse. Um, so that kind of gives you an overview of what Lero is doing at the moment in terms of research and what's been ongoing for the past few years. But this kind of gives you a little indicator of where it's going. So the research areas, um, broadly speaking, are that Lero works in are systems, methods and context. So what we build, how we build it, and for the world that we want, so the context that it's in. So as you can see from the slide, these are the areas that we're moving towards. So agri-tech and food is fairly straightforward. Um, connected autonomous vehicles. So one of the projects that's ongoing with that is we have researchers in NUI Galway who are designing the next generation of sensors for um, autonomous vehicles. So currently, for some of you leaving the house this morning when there was snow, that can interfere with um, the sensors that are currently on the cars. So, for example, your sensors for reversing and also your cameras. So, it's about elevating the ability of these sensors to be able to deal with all different environments. Um, another area that uh, Euro researchers are working in is smart communities and cities. And that's really, really varied. It means a lot of things. But I suppose I try to break it down into a bite sized example in each thing. And for this one, I always think about um, traffic lights and emergency vehicles and the fact that the technology exists to um, change the flow or the stream of green lights in a traffic system and maybe to integrate that with emergency services so that um, emergency vehicles can get to hospitals quicker or to accidents. Um, FinTech, financial technology, um, there's a lot of very large, uh, large scale work going on around that um, to do with payments and insurance regulation and that side of it. Um, health, wellbeing and human performance. Um, so this is kind of a, an area that things are moving towards, connected health. So an example of a, a connected health program that Lero was involved in is one that um, where the, uh, the researcher went in and looked at the processes within University Hospital in Limerick in one particular area. And when they identified certain things that could be changed in certain ways that could be approached differently and certain ways that software could be used a little bit differently, they, um, emerged with a 30% reduction in the waiting times for certain imaging um, <coughs> so scans and scans imaging. Also now they've just started a project on gestational diabetes. Um, government, go, GovTech, which is um, you know, basically the way that we've all moved towards doing our, um, all of our government services now are provided online. So it's about high insurance systems and cyber security and that kind of stuff. So a lot of really interesting research going on. Um, we're actually really lucky today because two of the researchers who are um, involved in a project with Lero are actually here. So Artem Bielorazov uh, and uh, Rehan Iktikar. So they're both here from DCU. And their project is maybe especially interesting for retailers who might be here, people in SMEs and um, in retail. So the overall goal of their group, which is the Perform Network, which is led by Dr. Marcus Halliford in DCU, um, their project is to establish a training network to prepare the next generation of digital retail managers. So Rahan is looking at how digital technologies can be used to integrate online and offline retail channels to improve interactions with customers. And Artem, his research deals with using real-time data to provide personalised promotions to customers in physical retail stores. So both really interested in kind of cutting edge stuff in retail and very interested in working with SMEs. So the guys will be out on the stand if anyone wants to talk to them afterwards. So as you can see from all of this, um, those are the areas that Lira was actually designing. So better processes, better software, smarter cities, all of that. But I'm here to talk about my part, which is maybe slightly less interesting, but a bit more accessible. Um, so, SFI research, research centres are based at higher education centres around, or institutes around the country. They do absolutely amazing things, 
really, really interesting research, really high societal impact. Um, but maybe the focus up until now hasn't been really on communicating that to people. So in the case of Euro, um, I guess the establishment of a marketing communications function sort of reflects that move towards not just doing the research, but also the fact that there's an onus on us to communicate a little bit better. Um, not just because it receives public funding, but also because of the societal impact and because of the public engagement aspects of the research. So the key objective, I guess, of anyone in my role should be the elevation of Euro and also Ireland's reputation as a hub of software excellence. Um, well, that's a pretty big ask for anyone, and especially you know, in a very short time. Now, in SMEs, your motivation to, for communicating what you do might be very, very different, but um, you, know, you might be using it to generate new leads, to raise funding, to increase football, to increase sales, but ultimately, the actions required to build your brand and to increase your reputation are very, very similar across the board. Um, so to just think a little bit about reputation and brand, like what is the difference between the two of them? And in SMEs, very often your reputation precedes your brand, um, because, unless you know, you're a franchisee or you're a really established company. But the American Marketing Association defines your brand as the name, term, design, symbol, or any other feature that identifies one seller's goods or services as, as, as distinct from those of another. So as you can see, brand is really, really customer focused. You can make strategic brand decisions. The brand conveys a lot of messages about your product. It can tell about its quality, about your service, about the price point. All of these different messages are going on in your brand the whole time. And they are something that you shape. But your reputation is what others think of you. And it is much, much harder to influence, I wouldn't even say control, but to influence. Sorry. Um, so the way that I look at it is, brand is what you create, and reputation is what you earn. Um, and lots of companies focus very heavily on brand, and that's where a lot of marketing money is spent. Um, but arguably, it's good work and good communication that builds your reputation. So we think Dr. Um, Janine McGinn mentioned earlier about trust and it being really, really important for creativity and creative design, but it is also really the cornerstone of a good reputation. So reputation, as you can see, is how your various stakeholders perceive the business. And your online reputation is especially important because it amplifies your real life reputation and that can be for better or worse. So, I suppose that raises three questions. Who are you? What does the internet, or who does the internet think you are? And who do you want to be? So, companies, more and more, and I think probably a lot of you are very familiar with this, are having to use social media tools as a customer's relation, customer relations management tool. And um, customers more and more targeting businesses' social media accounts to air their grievances. And from a business point of view, it's very, very easy to feel totally under siege at times. But the internet, for all its flaws, and probably more so because of those flaws, can actually provide companies with free insights into their reputation. So up until fairly recently, it was very difficult and very expensive for companies to measure their reputation. Because, and I think um, Alan referenced this earlier on, but if somebody thought negatively of you or your brand or whatever else, not that, you know, very few of them are actually going to actually <coughs> say it to you. More, much more so, it has become a place, a, a pattern of behaviour where it's said online or they say it to other people. So, um, I guess you've got to be able to take a measure of what people think of you and online is a really good space to do that. So, I suppose for the people here, from SMEs, do you know what your reputation is? Have you really, really thought about it? You know, um, do you really know what people think of you? Or do you just know what you want them to think of you and how you think of yourself? So you can have excellent brand awareness but a bad reputation. So just to you know, kind of bear that in mind a little bit. So how to go about designing or approaching an online reputation? So who are you? 
the first thing you've got to do is really, really define your brand. And most SMEs, you know what your core message is if you're, you know, the owner or the manager. But does, can you describe your core message in one sentence? And if you can, is that what your staff say? Is that what your colleagues say? Is that what all the internal stakeholders say? Is that how they describe it? Do they maybe struggle a little bit with communicating that? So, communications within the organisation is really, really important. And in an SME in particular, everybody should be able to describe that core business, that core message in one sentence. At its most basic, if you look at it, if you've, once you've asked your spouse and your staff and everyone in the business how they describe it, at its most basic, your company and your organisation should be described in the same language across all of your online presence and all of your controllable kind of messaging. So I'm talking about your online platforms, your marketing collateral, your um, social media channels, all of that should be carrying the same type, the same core message about your business. So that's all good and well once you've defined who you are and you know figured out how people within your organization see your reputation. But the saying goes that if it's not measured, it's not managed. So you've got to really assess your reputation. So who does the internet think you are? So when you're looking at your online reputation as a human being or as a business entity, like the first thing to do is to Google yourself, obviously. And maybe you need a glass of brandy or something before you do it to steady yourself, because sometimes it can throw up some real surprises. Um, and when I say to Google yourself, don't just stop on the, you know, the basic page. Google yourself in the news section, in the images section, all of it, or your brand. See what the internet is saying about you across all of the fields. So when you've done that and when you've kind of revived, consider setting up Google News Alerts so that you know all the time what is being said online about your brand. And more than that, consider widening that out a little bit. What about your competitors? Maybe it's useful to see what they're doing online, what their online reputation is. And even to take it you know, a step further to look at the broader industry. And again, I think Alan referenced this earlier, to be looking at things that are going on, trends within the industry, and how you can use those and how you can leverage them for you and your reputation. So hospitality businesses, I mean, you know, they're the bane of your life, but review sites really, really do paint a picture, sometimes a very flattering one, or one that maybe you don't want to engage with too heavily, but it is really what the public are seeing when they look for you online. And also, most of you, if you've got anyone working in your social media, in a social media role within the organisation, if you're doing it yourself, you're already engaging in a certain amount of social listening. Um, you know, when people tag you or mention you and so on. But it might be worth taking that a little bit further and just using the, um, some of your social listening tools or the social um, media channels themselves and using those to search your business name and to see what's coming up. Because maybe people are saying things about you but they're not tagging you or they're not flagging it in some other way. And also it can be really, really useful for to identify trends and possible threats um, that might be emerging online in terms of uh, reputation. So more than that then, sometimes people focus very much on what the negative is and what might be coming up on the negative side of it. But there's also industry groups and your peers. What are they saying about you? You know, have you won awards? Maybe that's something that you're not leveraging for your reputation. Um, it kind of comes back to Alan's point when he was talking about what they did with the um, IU domain registry and looking for honest feedback. And, you know, that can be a terrifying thing, but it is well worth it and it's absolutely something you should do. Because if you're not doing it, other people are. Other people are Googling you and this is what they're seeing. Other people are getting these messages. So definitely it's worth assessing it at that stage. Once you've assessed it, it's time for a little bit of self-reflection and to evaluate the criticisms and to address them. And with a lot of criticisms, you have to just pause and ask yourself very coldly, is there any truth in them? And very often you'll want there not to be, but there may be. So 
even in situations where you feel that, let's say you get a bad review and that there was something went wrong and you feel like the customer or the complainant was completely wrong, even still, is it worth leaving the negative review there to put others off? Is it worth that in terms of the real business cost of whatever you're going to have to do to change it? So within that, you've got to look at, I suppose, what's needed, what can make the changes that will... It, it comes down to, I guess, integrating your online and your offline. <coughs> so you can have an amazing you know, shop where the people are really friendly and really sound and everything, but your online presence can be very scattered, very disparate, and not very linear, let's say. And so maybe it comes down to staff training, maybe it comes down to new policies, maybe it comes down to greater flexibility, one-on-one -on -one with customers, whatever it is, whatever changes you have to make, you probably have to make them in the real world, in your day-to-day -day business. But once you make the changes, communicate them. And that's a way of negating some of the, maybe, mistakes that were made in the past. So that's kind of one of the actions. But beyond that, there's a lot of opportunities. So that's really reactive stuff. So you're reacting to what's already there, what already exists, what people can already see and what people are already saying about you. But in terms of opportunities that exist, design is all about being creative and sometimes it can take a bit of time to think about what you want to do and how you can, um, how you can raise your profile and your reputation. And in a lot of SMEs, you just, you're so caught up in the operational that it can be very hard to take a step back and really think about the strategy and where you want to go, what opportunities exist. And oftentimes you only think of them after the opportunity has passed, which is a nightmare scenario if you don't bring it in the next time. But so, among the things that you can do is, first of all, and this is, you know, I'm sure most of you have already done this and it's already there, but I took a kind of a cursory glance around um, websites last night to see what some of the local businesses around me are doing online and to be honest with you some of them have absolutely beautiful shops that you go into and when you see their websites it in no way reflects the core of the business the brand itself the good reputation they have the excellent service the good quality none of those things are coming through because of their website and i'm speaking very um, briefly to elaine moyles outside from the leo and um, we were just talking about the opportunities that exist for people to, and um, for small businesses in particular, to get grants to develop their website. Or if maybe they feel like they've already got a website that they like the look and feel of, maybe to move that forward and look at maybe a digital strategy or something like that. And that there are supports there for small businesses looking for that. On social media, there's loads of opportunities and people can be very, very afraid of social media because they feel like the risks are so great in it in terms of what you can do to your reputation. But sometimes that comes from being maybe too active, feeling like you've got to keep posting, posting, posting all the time and posting things that maybe aren't that interesting or that good of content for your customers, for your audience. And um, so a little bit of, you know, we'll come back to what Derek said about empathy and really empathising with your customers, so creating and sharing content that is relevant to them and that is adding value for them. So also then, the media obviously present a really, really good opportunity for a lot of businesses. <coughs> but... It's a happy it can be a happy hunting ground, that is true. <laughs> um, but the advice that I give people around media is to be proactive. So one of the things, when I worked as a journalist, I used to often get businesses coming to me given out that they weren't included in you know, various features or that they weren't considered or that I've done something with a competitor and that kind of things. And always I would turn around and ask them, oh, okay, so when was it that you contacted me to tell me that you were doing this? And always the answer was never. So, you know, when you do that to understand maybe that newsrooms, um, for all that is said about them, are totally under-resourced, and journalists are very time poor. So if you make it very easy for them, if you tell them what their story is, what your story is, and why it is interesting to their audience, they will absolutely be on board with it. But if you go very heavy-handed in a kind of more of a sales way, it is not going to be, it's not adding value for what they are looking for. So I guess just to be a little bit proactive around that. So that kind of comes back to you know good content. But if you're not going to be 
you know, writing a story maybe or sending in press releases, maybe there's an opportunity to write columns. And columns is such a funny one because it's a big, um, it's, it can be very daunting and you have to know that you have the ideas for it to be able to keep it going, to sustain it. And it also takes a massive amount of work. So that's something to consider if, you're, if you think that it's a great idea or if you're approached about it, just to take into account that you, as somebody who's already stretched in multiple directions, are going to have to really pause and take time to do that. And also a blog. And um, I think Alan mentioned this earlier about blogs, that you could, obviously it needs to be updated regularly, but it can be on very topical things. It doesn't have to be completely wed to what you're doing, but it does have to be relevant to the core mission and the core message. Um, and finally, I suppose I'd say just to leverage positive news, leverage that good content, use it. Sometimes you've got really good things going on and you're not using it to highlight, you know, your business and to really, really link it with your business. So sometimes there can be amazing things going on in the industry. For example, you know, the, the research studies and that kind of thing that's very, very relevant to what you do. And it takes time to find that content and to put your own spin on it, but it is really worthwhile. So, to finish off, I guess, the most important thing with your reputation is to be patient. Because a reputation is built over time. <coughs> and at Lero, it has a strong reputation, which is earned over the last 13 years. And it's built on excellent research. But now, I suppose, to, to increase that a little bit further, is about communicating that work, and also the societal impact of it. So, thank you very much. I hope to find something new to